welcome to BCM 215 Game Media Industries. In the first part of this lecture, we're going to expand on the media archaeology approach and the idea of discourse from the previous lecture and explore the history of video games in terms of the relationship between analog and digital games. In the second part of the lecture, we're going to focus on progressing your approach to the game media analysis and look at developing your plan for your digital artifacts. To begin this week, I want to highlight key discourses that structure the way we understand and think about and talk about the history of the video game industry, one of which locates its origins in the 1980s. The narrative associated with the history of the video game industry is the spectacular success and then almost complete demise of the Atari Corporation. As we saw last week, Atari was founded in California in 1972 by Nolan Bushnell and Teb Dabney. Following the success of Pong, Atari entered the home console market with the video computer system, later renamed the Atari 2600. Bushnell sold Atari to Warner Communications in 1976 for around $30 million. And as you can see from the sales records, the Atari Corporation had an incredible rise in profits from 1978 to 1982. But then, a disastrous series of decisions led to the tremendous crash of the home video game console market in 1983 and the general decline of the video game industry. Following the crash, however, we see the meteoric rise of Nintendo as video game arcades in the US began to close by the late 1980s. Nintendo was colonizing American households and households around the world, although in the US, at least 30% of all families owned a copy of the Nintendo Entertainment System, the Nintendo console. This is a discourse, this is a narrative that is an important part of the video game industry and its history. It's a cautionary tale, and it is a common way in which we understand the history of the video game industries globally. But in reality, history is very messy, and it can't be contained to a single decade, a single event, or even one or two major video game companies. We're going to come back to this narrative a little bit later in, in lectures when we look at particular video game developers and designers. But there are many other, less well-known stories and events that reveal how dominant discourses of history often overlook the social, economic, political, cultural, and geographic conditions under which this history operates. This is also true of another major discourse that dominates the way we understand and talk about video games. Known as the media effects theory, this is the idea that media can directly change the way we think and behave, that exposure to certain types of media can program us to act in certain ways. It's also very much associated with discourses around addiction and violent content. We saw last week the long-term association between games and gambling. In fact, in uh, many places around the world, like the United States, the gaming industry actually refers to the gambling industry. So there's lots of arguments about the psychological effects of games including addiction and, of course, increased violent behavior. This is often a feature of political speak. In the past, it's been religious leaders that have talked about this and social leaders. But we often see this discourse replicated in news media, whether it's talking about parlor games, pinball machines, or the latest Call of Duty. Media effects theory is still very much a part of dominant discourses and influences the way we understand and talk about video games, especially the way people who don't play video games talk about them. Now, this is endlessly replayed by politicians, by parents, and of course, media that are in direct competition with the games industry for the attention of consumers, you know, particularly other screen media and news media. Remember in the first lecture when I was talking about why games are different, and that is because there is an intensity to playing games. Even playing you know, games on your phone, there's a, there's a massive difference in the type of interactions required between the software and the human mind and the human body. The intensity of video games is the incorporation of the player 
as part of the hardware of the game. This makes games a very easy target. Overly simplistic claims about their effects, both negative and positive. I'm sure you've all seen games that promote brain training. Another discourse that we looked at in the previous lecture is the idea of the military entertainment complex. This is essentially the association between military themed games and the larger matrix of the defense industry. In 2014, The Guardian reported that the writer and producer for the Call of Duty series, Dave Anthony, had actually been appointed to Washington to consult with the U.S. Department of Defense. This typical discourse is framed around the association between the military and different types of media, whether it's historically you know, books and fiction, film and television, comics, games, even the music industry. There is a, an association between this type of media and support for U.S. military troops, policies, strategies, actions. And this goes all the way from historical recreations to media that is designed to promote the military lifestyle in order to benefit recruitment. From overt propaganda movies that were actually co-scripted with the Department of Defense, like Top Gun and Transformers, to games that are actually used by military training to prepare soldiers for different situations, to popular franchises that seek to reflect actually attractive combat experiences, stories that people invest in and, and might encourage them to join the military. The military entertainment complex is quite similar in terms of its discursive effects to the media effects theory. It makes clear associations between the types of media that people enjoy consuming and the types of decisions that people make consciously or unconsciously or subconsciously in their everyday lives and even points to kind of deeper psychological effects. The history of the relationship between the military, nation states and games particularly in terms of how entire cultures and societies come to understand concepts of time, space, place, and relations with others, is of course much larger and deeper than simple concerns over propaganda. So in this lecture, and in this section of the lecture, I want to use the media archaeology approach and a broader kind of historical contextual approach to expand on these discourses and to begin to unpack them and understand the video game industry in terms of trends and precursors that have influenced the history of the video games industries in particular ways that we enjoy today, but often go unacknowledged. Actual physical Archaeology has taught us that the military entertainment complex is an ancient phenomenon. This Roman glass dice has 20 sides, each featuring different alchemical symbols, and it was found by archaeologists in locations where the Roman legions encamped across Europe. It was found alongside other games related objects, including carved bones for gambling, and there is some evidence of early card-type inscriptions. The Royal Game of Ur is the earliest known board game. It was played in Mesopotamia during the 3rd millennium BCE, and it's widely, it was widely popular across the Middle East, later transforming, we think, into backgammon, which is a popular board game around the world. Known as the Game of Kings, the Royal Game of Ur it was actually popular amongst all social classes. And while it is connected to gambling and ideas about military control and under helping players understand strategic relationships with people, it was also believed in some instances to be able to convey uh, supernatural messages from entities like gods and, and spirits and that kind of thing. Games have been used to represent and replicate conflict throughout history. Perhaps most notably and well-known is the board game chess. Although largely abstract in form, chess has been romanticized for its representation of courtly intrigue, political maneuvering, and outright conflict. Chess is thought to have arisen in the East, most likely in India around 5th century, but there's some evidence of it also being popular in China at that time. And it wasn't really introduced into the West until about a thousand years ago. 
Versions of chess became very popular in Italy and Spain around the 15th century. That's where the pieces that we know today as the king, the queen, the pawn, the knight, and the bishop were kind of formalized. The rules for chess, however, were only internationally formalized and recognized very recently with the invention of the Chess World Championships in 1886. Chess is thought of as a war game because it is a good way of teaching programmatic and strategic thinking, but it lacks many of the elements that we might think of as being important to a realistic warfare simulation. Over time, there have been many modifications and versions of chess, including new types of units, different board setups, and uh, these were, of course, used in military training schools in order to teach different approaches to strategic thinking. In 1780, Johann Helwig published the rules for a popular chess variant, collectively known as Kriegspiel, the German word for war game. Helwig's design expanded the chessboard from an 8x8 grid to a tabletop, a 49 by 33 square board featuring multiple types of units, terrain, and different mechanics designed to emulate the battlefield. According to Rolf Noah in the Journal of Computer Game Culture from 2010, and I'll put a link to the article in the subject Moodle page, Helwig argued that his war game was a means for learning the truths of tactical and strategic warfare. He argued that it emphasized a naturalness and a type of learning that he described as sensuousness. And he was referring to the materiality of the game and the way the game was organized and the the movement of pieces and coming to an understanding of time and space and strategic relations between people through this material object. Helwig notes that the final purpose of a tactical game is to centralize the substance of the most important appearances of war. The more precisely the nature of this item is imitated, the closer the game comes to its perfection. Helwig's innovation was an important reconceptualization of space, time, movement, and actions, particularly of warfare, but also of resource management within a game system. This resulted in a simulation that was, in a sense, realistic, non-static, and modular. Here the argument about the military entertainment complex becomes much more sophisticated ideologically and conceptually than simply worrying about media effects and propaganda. It is a way of understanding the hybridization of military knowledge, such as tactics and strategies, and an approach to thinking about the world in terms of control and resources, and the broader aspects of everyday life, such as playing a game for entertainment. Helwig argued that the war game he created was a didactic instrument, a means to teach through both simulation and experience, not simply to condition players to accept the realities of war or conflict as a way of life, but to convey the importance of politics. As Noah writes, it is not the most brutal fighter who wins the war, but the most political or even better scientific actor. Kriegspiel marks the transition in thinking about warfare as a kind of natural state Kriegspiel is about understanding warfare in a rational, scientific, economic, cultural, social, and political, as well as geographic system. It's less about the heroic deeds of soldiers and the romanticism of warfare, and more about the skillful control of space and the planning of menacing situations that force the enemy to withdraw. Basically, the best conflict is one where no one is killed. In the previous lecture, we spoke about the mix of structural and post-structural thinking in Roger Calois' system for categorizing games and types of play. And I want to mention it here because Kriegspiel brings together what we call as the paedic and the ludic, the playful and the rules-based systems into a dynamic relationship. There are clearly formal ludic rules for managing time and space and movement and conflict in Kriegspiel. 
But the simulation has a high degree of complexity. And with complexity comes uncertainty. And when there is an uncertainty in a simulation, that situation is an opportunity for playfulness. Playfulness, particularly in the Padia sense, in which there is a negotiation between players, between players and the system. And this is what makes Kriegspiel a didactic instrument, a game that teaches as Noah describes it, by offering sensual play reproduction reenactment in an educational and enlightening way. Gunpowder changed warfare during the late medieval period, resulting in an increased importance on range and maneuvering. This saw politicians and nation states supporting military forces to invest a great deal of time and money into cartography, mapping, and it was this cartography that led to the rise of war game simulations in the Prussian military academy during the Napoleonic Wars. You see this kind of simulation in all representations of warfare now, particularly in an organizational sense, whether it's early war movies to uh, the way modern video games represent landscape through maps, even you know, science fiction, Star Wars, you know, when the, when the rebels are, uh, are planning the attack on the Death Star, you see a a cartography, a map of the Death Star that is used to, to plan the assault. This is super important in terms of media archaeology because it demonstrates how the implementation of technical innovations are part of the larger cultural, material, and geographic structural decision-making that results in a matrix of forces that are actually much larger than just the simple deer of the military entertainment complex. The emphasis should be on the complex rather than the military and the entertainment. This is true of both the technological innovation of gunpowder, but also the technological innovations in mapping and surveying that were important to the science and precise nature of cartography. Another important innovation that Kriegspiel offers, and, and this also comes from chess, the game of Ur, and other tabletop games, is that this cartography is represented through the bird's eye view of conflict, looking down at the situation. And this produces a particular reality for understanding the complexities of war. Yes, it is abstracting the gruesome reality of conflict by turning soldiers into discrete wooden blocks, which became the standard pattern of military simulation and the ludic understanding of play and war itself. And of course, very rarely do these kinds of simulations involve civilians. This abstraction is condensing complex systems of knowledge and it's reconceptualizing geopolitical and biopolitical relations and requires a new type of imagination, a new type of playfulness that's not necessarily innocent in order to negotiate the complex systems successfully and come up with a winning strategy. Kriegspiel was so popular and influential, it's actually credited as contributing to the Prussian victory in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. A more accessible and perhaps popularized form of war game was published by science fiction author H.G. Wells in 1913, titled Little Wars, a game for boys from 12 years of age to 150 and for that more intelligent sort of girl who likes boys' games and books. Wells' version of the war game integrated the ludic dimensions of the simulation with the more paedic version of toy soldiers to shift the focus from kind of realistic simulation and mimicry to what Kalwa describes more as kind of illinix or chaos. Little Wars is not played on the tabletop, but the floor, and it encourages a move from the, the kind of grand strategy to more attention to individual soldiers or at least units of soldiers who actually belong to real military forces, often involving recreations of historical battles. But Little Wars changes the view. It's no longer a, a totally top-down view. It asks you to get on the floor and have an understanding of warfare from your soldier's point of view. And often these soldiers were you know, hand-painted. And there's a, there's a huge uh, board game industry associated with this kind of tabletop game now. Where Kriegspiel's conceptualization of time and space was cartographic and strategic, Little War's focus is more tactical, personalized, 
and even socio-historical, as the toy soldiers were often painted in specific regimental colours, and fans of the game had histories, uh, detailed histories of the, the soldiers themselves who were part of those units. So this was a very different way of entering into this military entertainment complex than Kriegspiel. By combining the approach of Kriegspiel and Little Wars, the board game publisher Avalon Hill became famous for establishing a niche board game industry in the 1950s and 60s that we now know as the tabletop war game industry. It's still a very successful and popular hobby, and it was Avalon Hill that popularized the use of what's called odds ratio combat results tables. This is where you, you roll a series of dice depending on what's attacking. And with the results of the dice, you look at the table and that tells you whether you hit or missed. It also tells you whether you saved against a hit with armor or you were damaged and how much damage you took. This was a, a hugely important innovation for games. Avalon Hill games introduced variable movements, maps, squares, hexes, hidden movement, and all different types of dice, taking from Kriegspiel, of course, and, and other uh, war game variations, but trying to compress them into a, into a much more entertaining, ludic experience that you could play in a short period of time. Avalon Hill games recreated battles from World War I, World War II, and of course, um, much, much older battles. These games heavily influenced the play lives and the meaning-making practices of early video game developers. And this is what's often overlooked in the kind of media effects theory and the military entertainment complex discourse is that it's not necessarily what's being represented might change your behavior, but rather the systems, the, the ludic systems and the paedic interactions that have an influence. They might not actively change the way you behave. They might not subconsciously or unconsciously be impacting on your mind, but you can see video game developers observing what's successful in the tabletop industry and taking that and applying that to early video games. It's very easy to see the role between the military entertainment complex and the kind of ideological discursive dimensions of video games, whether it's colonialism or propaganda to the naturalization and centralization of conflict because games are essentially free of consequences. That's what makes them so important and powerful activity in our culture. But I would argue that it is the lack of consequences that invites what you might think of as a playful sensibility. War games are not simply a didactic teaching tool to encourage its players to internalize an understanding of the world through conflict or resource management. It's not about the idea that war is natural and inevitable and we should be good at it in order to win. But rather, war games are a didactic tool because they encourage an approach to understanding the world through failure. Not winning at games is just as important as victory. Failure promotes a playful sensibility when the consequences are particularly ludic. Failure is a great teacher. And it was actually Mackenzie Walk who described gamers as people who come to an understanding of the world through quantifiable failure. It's easy to see traces of these systems emerge in popular culture. The early video game developers who created the arcade hits Asteroids, Space Invaders, and Missile Commands were growing up after the Second World War. They were coming of age during the Cold War era under the constant threat of thermonuclear war and reflecting Hollywood's dealing with that in terms of science fiction monsters, post-apocalyptic scenarios, and total devastation. But by the 1980s, a new generation of video game developers were emerging who were tired of the representational and logistical constraints 
of the simulation war games. And that actually grown up in this later Cold War era where there was a cultural shift in the 1960s and 1970s away from realism towards fantasy and high adventure. And it's here we see the rise of the role-playing game or RPG. It's quite interesting that in current times, we are seeing the resurgence of interest in the fantasy genre. It probably goes back to the early 2000s and Lord of the Rings. And and of course, it's high point more recently with Game of Thrones. Where war games had conceptualized space and time and movement and agency and decision making within highly ludic terms that offered a good degree of paedia and playful thinking in terms of negotiation, role playing games inverted that paradigm entirely. One of the early pioneers of the RPG or role playing game genre, Gary Gygax, was living in the American Midwest town of Lake Geneva and with his friends he began to imagine a war game system that would provide a ludic simulation in order to better realize the playful potential of fantasy worlds. Gygax was a fan of the fantasy genre and books like Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and stories like Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian. A fan of tabletop war games, Gygax began to experiment and bring fantasy elements into his games, including, of course, all the major tropes of fantasy, like other races, right? You know, orcs and dragons and elves, and of course, magic and wizards and sorcerers. Together with hobby store owner Jeff Perrin, Gygax self-published Chainmail, Rules for Medieval Miniatures in 1971. Its popularity amongst the wargaming community was instantaneous. Others started to modify and contribute to Chainmail with their own modules, creating specific scenarios that could be played by following the setting guide. These were designed for action and adventure over historical recreation and simulation. Gygax was particularly impressed with the work of Dave Arneson, whose chainmail module established a more nuanced system for players to allow them to take control of individual characters, moving away from controlling entire armies to taking over a, you know, a single warrior, for example, attempting to sneak into a castle and raid it for treasure. Gygax and Arneson worked on a project at first simply called the Fantasy Game, which de-emphasized the conflict and competitive nature of war game. Still there, there's still those ludic elements, but it focused on the highly paedic and collaborative storytelling experience. Rather than directly pitting two players together, it rewarded a group of players coming together to solve puzzles, overcome obstacles, and improvise while going on an adventure at the tabletop. Gygax and Arneson took on investors and created the company Tactical Studies Rules, TSR, and they began to publish the game under the title Dungeons and Dragons in 1974. This continued the importance of maps and strategy and movement and, of course, the varied types of dice from traditional war games, but it introduced new degrees of storytelling, freedom, agency, decision-making, improvisation, character building, and progress. It encouraged players to choose racial types and professions, each with distinct weaknesses and strengths, resulting in the common role-playing tropes that we know today, the dwarves, the humans, and elven, but also the standard, you know, kind of fighter, thief, cleric, wizard classes that we know are common to RPG games. Now, Dungeons and Dragons wasn't the first, but it was definitely one of the most important games to feature player hit points that you could take damage over time and recover hit points over time. As you progressed, you would get more hit points so your characters would get stronger. And of course, this was enabled through the concept of experience points, which you got points for completing tasks and doing heroic deeds. The more experience points you got, the more skills you got, and the more abilities you got, and the more influence that you got, and the stronger that your character became, and the the more grander adventures that you could go on. These are all now fundamental fixtures in various iterations in video game systems today. D&D was a massive success, and it it still is. The game is in its uh, fifth edition, 
uh, published by Wizards of the Coast, which is a subsidiary of the toy and board game company Hasbro. D&D heavily influenced and inspired those working in the video game industry today, not just in terms of the fantasy genre, because D&D and other role-playing games and the role-playing game industry quickly took off and you can find RPGs in science fiction and, of course, the many thousands of hybrid genres, right, from steampunk to, to post-apocalypse. If it were not for war games like chess and Kriegspiel and role-playing games like uh, Dungeons & Dragons, we wouldn't have the masterpieces uh, of the video games industries like the Legend of Zelda series. You can see right from the earliest Zelda game, it is a role-playing game. A role-playing adventure game, if you like. It's based on core RPG fixtures, including defeating monsters, finding treasures, exploring dungeons, getting equipment, and, of course, overcoming evil to save the world. It was the success of the Zelda series that arguably helped Nintendo to resurrect the home video game console market in the mid-1980s. Of course, Donkey Kong played its part, but... To return to this dominant discourse of the history of video games and the, you know, the traditional narratives about the 1980s and the video game industry crash, often folks in the industry and particularly in media reports when looking at the history of video games talk about the 80s and, and talk about Atari's lack of control over the content on its home console system. It was very easy for anyone with some programming knowledge to replicate Atari's software and, and create their own games and print cartridges for the system. It didn't have the, the, the kind of uh, chip that uh, the Nintendo system had, which ensured that you couldn't use unauthorized or unlicensed games. There was lots of unlicensed games, but also Atari just licensed everything. In its rush to capitalize on an aging console, Atari filled the market with cheap, badly designed and barely functioning games that were often focused on movie adaptations and promotional content. E.T., the extraterrestrial video game, was released for the Atari 2600 in 1982, roughly based on the Steven Spielberg blockbuster movie. The game was so rushed, it had about five and a half weeks, I think, so rushed to market that it was a complete commercial disaster. Most copies were returned because they were buggy and didn't work and were just not very fun. And E.T. is commonly known as the kind of worst video game of all time and also the biggest commercial failure uh, in video game history, very significantly leading to the crash. I mean, it wasn't the only thing that led to it. The, the cost of the cartridges was dropping considerably. The quality of the games was dropping consider considerably. And as the market crashed, Atari was left with so much stock, physical copies of the game, that they actually buried them in a New Mexico landfill. This landfill was, was forgotten about and um, recently rediscovered, I think, in 2014. And it's actually the topic of a, of a documentary. This comes back to my point about failure. Failure is so important that the Smithsonian Institute includes... Uh, an excavated cartridge from the landfill in its collection. The typical history, right, the typical narrative, the dominant discourse about video game history suggests that it was largely Nintendo's licensing arrangement and strict quality control that ensured its dominance in the video game industry of the late 1980s. But if you look closely at the successful game franchises that emerged in that era, you see Super Mario Brothers, The Legend of Zelda, Metroid, Konami's Castlevania, and Square's Final Fantasy, and of course Enix's Dragon Quest. These are all massively popular franchises, and games in these series are still being released today on new consoles. All of these titles, from the, their very first iteration, feature design tropes that were pioneered in the move from war games to role-playing games. Hit points, collecting treasure, gaining equipment, exploring dungeons, freedom of movement, highly affective gameplay, and of course, individual decision making. It wasn't just corporate intellectual property control that, that Nintendo had 
and Atari didn't that revived the video game industry, but a total fusion of military simulation models embedded in the tabletop wargaming with the fantasy literature tropes and the new degrees of agency enabled by role-playing games. This new balance and understanding between the ludic and the paedic elements that gave players an entirely new set of experiences in these amazing, often fantasy, but also science fiction worlds. This is the broader contextual history that contributes to the influence that Nintendo still has today. Nintendo have had massive success with the launch of their new console, the Switch, and of course their flagship game, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, features all of the, the classic core RPG elements and has sold more than 15 million copies since launch. So that's where I'm going to finish up uh, this section of the lecture. In the next part, I'm going to return to a focus on the digital artifact and thinking about planning your schedule for your DA production.